Okay, welcome to the second video in the series on fluid and electrolyte issues. This one's on hyponatremia. And I realize many people think hyponatremia is difficult. Actually, that's probably not fair. I don't think it's that difficult, particularly if you approach it as I'm going to show you. Really, hyponatremia only has about seven causes. And each one of the causes ends in osis. First of all, there is cardiosis. Then there is cirrhosis, and then nephrosis, and then psychosis, and then pharmacosis, and then puniosis. Okay, I did make up several of those terms, but you'll understand why I did that and what they mean. So sit back, enjoy, thank you. Today we're gonna to talk about hyponatremia, obviously low sodium. And when I think about hyponatremia, I like to think about it this way as I do with most fluid and electrolyte problems, and if you watch my video on acidosis, you'll see I, I do it this way. I think of a liter of water. If you take a liter of water, which could be a liter in your bloodstream, or it could just be a liter of beaker of water here, and that's one liter. And in that one liter, we're gonna put sodium. How much sodium? We're gonna put 145. Now, I'm not gonna draw all these out, but we'll say one, two, dot, 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 so it's 145 of these sodiums in this liter of water, and that's normal. If you were to add, say, another 14 sodiums in the water, your body's going to naturally, through the kidney, add another 100 cc's because it likes to keep this nice and even. So some would say balanced, or the ratio is 145 to 1. Either way, it's always consistent. In health, hyponatremia is almost always due to an increase in water. The water is increasing. We're not getting fewer sodium. Most all hyponatremia patients, and I'll explain this in a second, most all hyponatremia patients actually are hypernatremic. If you were to take a hyponatremic patient and put them in an incinerator, and burn off everything and then count how much sodium is left, you're going to find out you have more sodium in that body than was intended for their weight. So hyponatremic patients are almost always hypernatremic. So really, I thought this is a misnomer. It really shouldn't be called hyponatremia. It should be called hyperwateremia, if there is such a thing. Hyperwateremia means that instead of being a liter of water, we're way up here. We have more water diluting out the sodium same amount of sodium just diluted out in more water almost always it's because the body held on to water when it shouldn't have well why would this be what are some of the causes why would the body hold on to water well when i think about it they fall into several categories and the best way to start thinking about it is like this now i'm not a pilot my friend is a pilot and here's his airplane. And when he's flying along, and if he smells something in the, in the cockpit, or if he hears a funny sound, or something's not right, the first thing he does is he gives it more fuel and gets higher in the air. Because for an airplane, altitude is safety. But your body does the same thing. But it's not altitude that's safety, it's water that's safety. Just about anything that upsets the normal milieu of your body, if your brain is confused, or something's not quite right, it immediately holds on to water, brings the water level up, because for a human, water is safety because it fills your blood vessels. If you're going to have a heart attack, the last thing you want to do is have a heart attack when your blood volume is way down because it, it limits oxygen delivery. Or if you're, you know, you're going to have a, a stroke or anything that confuses the brain, something's going on, we don't know what it is, but it holds on to water. So almost all hyponatremic cases are where the brain got confused and started to hold on to water. The first three common causes of it, if you know just these three causes, you probably have 80% of them. And I'm going to make these terms up, but it's cardiosis, cirrhosis, and nephrosis. 
the osuses. Osus is Latin for condition. So it's a cardiac condition, a liver condition, or a kidney condition. And really, it's kind of all the same thing. In cardiosis, it's either a valvular situation or a weak heart, or it could be a heart attack or a funny arrhythmia. Whatever it is, the forward flow of blood decreased, and your brain didn't get the blood flow that it needs, so it releases ADH, antidiuretic hormone. That's the same thing as the pilot giving the more fuel to the plane to get higher in the air. ADH is the signal to the kidney to cause the kidney to hold on to water. By the way, this is a crazy name. Who names a hormone for what it doesn't do? Antidiuretic hormone? Really, ADH should really be called the ad hydration hormone because we're adding hydration. It causes the kidney to add hydration. So, cardiosis is something wrong with the heart and you're adding water to the system to try to get it up because the heart pumps more efficiently when the volume is higher. Cirrhosis, same thing. With cirrhosis, you do have a decreased forward flow of blood because all the fluid is called third space. It's either in the belly or it's in, the, it's in edema in the legs or it's all sequestered on the venous side of our, of our vascular system. The arterial side, which the heart is pumping on, is deplete of fluid and you're getting decreased flow to the brain and the brain releases ADH and ADH holds on to water and we start dropping the serum sodium. Again, not because we're losing sodium, but because we're raising the water level. And then nephrosis is just about anything that causes kidney problems. Same thing. With kidney problems, you have a lot of edema, third spacing of fluid, and probably you have decreased arterial tone, decreased arterial fullness because the fluid tends to be sequestered on the venous side. Also, with nephrosis, it's like a, a black box. My St. My Dialysis patients who are the epitome of nephrosis, they have, have no kidney function. So you remove somebody's kidneys and then you give them water. Well, guess what? It stays in the system up here. When my dialysis patients go out of the dialysis unit, their sodium may be 145 normal because we dialyze them against the 145, but they're going to go home and drink fluid for the next two days. And as they're drinking, they're filling up the container because the fluid has nowhere to go and the sodium is dropping 140. But most dialysis patients, when they come in, they're going to be down to 125 to 130 level after about two days of no urine output. All it is is they just diluted themselves out. That's the nephrosis. So cardiosis, cirrhosis, and nephrosis are about 80% of the problems. So when you see a patient with hyponatremic, you're going to have about 80% of them right there. So what are the other causes? Well, I like to think of them also as osis. There's psychosis. And I mean this is kind of a, a generic term. Again, it, it's, it's not any specific disease process. Just like this is not, not any specific disease process. Cardiosis could be a valvular disease, a arrhythmia, or a you know, decreased myocardium, a heart attack. Again, cirrhosis could be anything that causes liver problems, anything that causes kidney problems. And this is anything that causes psychological problems. Psychological problems actually cause hyponatremia. A lot of people who are psychotic will be hyponatremic or after a seizure or with a big cancer in the brain. These things, the brain gets confused, releases the ADH. ADH brings the water level up. Again, it's a protective mechanism until we can sort out what's going on. So that's psychosis. Pharmacosis. Again, it's a made-up term, but it's still an osis. Pharmacosis is drugs. Certain drugs cause us to drop sodium to hold on to water, such as thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics, the way they work, they cause us to hold on to water. And I know that's kind of weird because we call them water pills. Actually, all diuretics do the same thing. They get rid of sodium. So they're getting rid of sodium, and what hydrochlorothiazide does, it actually holds on to water in its place. And we get hyponatremic. Just about any diuretic can cause hyponatremia, again, because the diuretics cause the kidneys to get rid of sodium, and the body panics because it sees the blood level dropping, and it holds on to water. So diuretics and hydrochlorothiazide are the common ones. 
The next one, it's rare. Again, if you have 80% here, probably another 10% here, or about 90%. And then the last 10% are fairly rare. There is pseudoosis. Pseudoosis is really pseudo hyponatremia. Pseudoosis is where you really don't have a low sodium, but what's happening is that there's something else in the bloodstream, like glucose. There's glucose molecules or lipids, particles or proteins, like a multiple myeloma, abnormal proteins. These particles all surround themselves with water, right? Every particle in the bloodstream surrounds itself with water. And because we have extra number of these particles surrounding themselves with water, we're actually increasing the water in the bloodstream because of what's in the blood, the, the abnormal number of particles in the blood. That's called pseudo-hyponatremia. It's not that common anymore because of the way the labs work. The labs can actually check for how many sodium particles are there, not the concentration of sodium. But you can still see pseudo-hyponatremia. You always see it with, with hyperglycemia. You can see it with multimyeloma, proteinuremias, and with, with hyperlipidemias, the lipids get high enough. And there's finally, there's this, this term, again, I made it up, called puniosis. Puniosis is where you see it in puny old ladies, or you can see it in, in older men. There's two disease processes under this, one called T and toast. I did not make that term up and beer ponomania. Beer ponomania and, and tea and toast are the same, same type of patients. They're puny patients. They tend to be malnourished, thin, and what it is is they're, they're not taking in enough protein. You do have to have some protein in your bloodstream because protein gets metabolized, and those metabolites, the BUN, the creatinine, and all the other gunk that we have when we eat protein, gets filtered by the kidney and just excreted. I think of it this way. About 10% of your urine is actually the water is drug out of your body surrounding those metabolites. So here's the metabolites of protein metabolism. So you eat protein, you metabolize it, those metabolites go to the kidney, the kidney flushes them out and pulls water with it. So about 10% of your urine is made up of the water diluting out the metabolites. But what if you're not eating enough metabolites, such as the tea and toast? Tea and toast is a little old lady who sits around and drinks tea and eats toast. And they're not getting enough protein in their diet. And so they don't have enough solute in their urine to pull that last 10%. So every day they're getting a little less water is being excreted by the kidney because it can't get rid of that final 10%. Same thing with beer potomania. Usually it's alcoholics. They do tend to be thin alcoholics. And beer has no protein in it. So they're, they're sitting around drinking beer and not getting enough protein in their diet. So the, the treatment for them is just to improve the protein in their diet and they can get rid of that last 10%. There's a couple of very rare hypothyroidism. Hypothyroid, and I don't know the mechanism of this. I know that in the olden days when we didn't have TSH to measure back in the 1950s, what they would do, they would do a, a free water clearance test. They would take somebody who they thought was hypothyroid, and if you give them like two liters of free water, D5W, you really shouldn't drop your serum sodium because you'll pee two liters of the water out as fast as, about as fast as you can give it IV. But if you're hypothyroid, for whatever reason, that doesn't happen and they tend to accumulate the water longer. So you give them two liters of water, they increase here and they dilute out their sodium. So it's an old fashioned test for hypothyroidism is if they can't excrete a free water load. And then there's this thing called reset osmostat. I'm not sure that's rare. It's, it's reported as being rare, but, but in my 30 years of practice, I think that actually may be pretty common. Reset osmosat often is confused with T and toast syndrome because you typically see it in older ladies. There are older females who, for whatever reason, just tend to, 
their body switches over and they tend to run a sodium about 125 or so with 145 being normal they drop down to 125 and they seem to be perfectly happy there so they have no ill effects from it when you give them sodium they just urinate out the sodium and drop back down to 125. when you try to deprive them of water they just stay at 125. it seems to be their new set point once I've gone through this whole process and I don't have any other thing and they are a thin old lady who's doing quite well, I just call it reset osmostat and just live with it. They don't seem to have any ill effects from it. So when I see a consult for hyponatremia and I see them every day, the first thing is just do a history and you're going to find almost 80% of the time cardiosis, cirrhosis, or nephrosis. There's something wrong with the heart, the, the liver, or the kidneys. And the treatment for these, actually treatment for all these is pretty much the same, is to decrease free water intake. Because if you don't take in water, you can't become hyponatremic. Also, what's the hardest thing to do in medicine? Is it, you know, I think that is brain surgery. I certainly couldn't do that. Would it be some sort of, you know, uh, thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair? I couldn't do that. But I came, in, came to the conclusion, the hardest thing to do in medicine because as providers, we always want to do something. So when you see a low sodium, we always want to intervene. We want to either give them a diuretic or we want to give them sodium tablets or we want to do something to try to get that sodium back up. And in reality, you can always get that sodium back up if you did nothing. The reason you would is because we humans evaporate over time. So if you take somebody who's hyponatremic and you make them strict NPO, they will, by the laws of nature, have to have their water content will go down and they will start concentrating around their sodium. It has to be that way. The problem is it may take two or three days. And sometimes we don't like two or three days. When we see a sodium of 120, we get panicky and think we've got to do something. But what you could do is nothing. They will, they will automatically go up. And nothing means nothing. It means strict MPO, no IV fluid. Don't try. What people do is they try to second guess and say, okay, let's give them 3% or let's give them normal saline or let's give them half normal saline and Lasix. I see that a lot. You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. You can somehow guess how the kidney is going to respond to all that. When the ideal thing to do would be nothing, just let them evaporate and it will increase. Mm -hmm. these, these can work. They can actually work too fast or they can work not at all. They can go the other way. So each one of these is a little bit dangerous and you're not treating the underlying problem, which is too much water. You know, 3% saline still has water in it. It still has free water in it. Normal saline, half normal saline, they still have free water in it. Lasix, it does get rid of free water, but you know what? It also gets rid of sodium. So you can make things worse if you're not careful with these, where you'll never make things worse if you do nothing. Psychosis is, you got to treat the underlying problem. There is this thing called psychogenic water drinkers too, by the way. And those are, are usually young patients who, for whatever reason, drink water to an abnormal amount. Now, most humans can drink plenty of water, 20 liters at a time, and, and we'll just urinate it out. But if you do that regularly, you actually will wash out the interstitium of your kidney. And at that point in time, you may not be able to eliminate water that efficiently. The pharmacosis, again, I always stop hydrochlorothiazide. When I see somebody with hyponatremic, I always stop hydrochlorothiazide because it is a very common cause of hyponatremia because of how it works. Diuretics are a tough one because, you know, most cirrhotics, most people with, with congestive heart failure, most people with, with some sort of kidney problems, they do need diuretics. But you got to be careful with them because diuretics do get rid of sodium. Like I said, they get rid of water, but they also get rid of sodium. Mm -hmm. So that can be counterproductive. But you still have to use them. The, the pseudohyponatremia, again, not a big problem usually. I do check, you obviously check blood sugar. I do check to uh, make sure, see what the protein level is in the bloodstream and the lipid level. If I'm, I think any, any idea that there's something not right here, I'll check that. Puneosis, tea and toast, being beer, you got to increase the amount of protein in the diet. So thyroid, obviously easy to treat. And then the reset osmostat, don't treat. Just let it go. So that's hyponatremia in a nutshell.